Some of you technicians who've been specializing, or just starting in, may not realize how much engines have changed in only a few years. Frank, an automatic transmission expert, is asking Joe to bring him up to date. Let's listen in. Joe, they're expecting more engine work in the shop, and I haven't worked on engines for quite a while. How about a quick refresher course? Okay, Frank. Now's as good a time as any. Besides, tech's standing by, so I'll be able to ask for help if I get in over my head. Well, they're still the same engines as far as the basic four-stroke principle goes. But they put out a lot more power per cubic inch and pound of weight than they used to. You see, as higher octane fuels came in, the engineers were able to increase engine power output by raising compression pressures instead of following the old pattern of adding extra cubic inches. For example, in the early 50s, the L head 6 with a 7 to 1 ratio was rated at 97 horsepower. Our present slant 6 with an 8.4 to 1 ratio is only 8 cubic inches larger, but is rated at 145 horsepower, almost 50% higher. Of course, there's more to the story than just raising the compression. Along with higher pressures came improved engine parts and more efficient manifolding, carburation, ignition, and cooling. All the various engine improvements are interesting, but it'll take a lot of time to cover them all in detail. Besides, what happens in the combustion chambers is more interesting than changes in the iron. Why don't you concentrate on that, Joe? Good plan, Tech. And so I won't skip anything, we might as well go through the whole combustion process in a simplified, basic engine, starting with the air-fuel mixture. I never did understand why so much air had to mix with the gas. What's the reason? When the spark plug fires, you need oxygen to make the gasoline burn. And air is only 21% oxygen. So we mix in a lot more air than fuel to get enough oxygen to make the mixture burn properly. As you probably know, an ideal power mixture is 12 to 13 parts air to one part fuel. And a good economy cruising mixture is between 16 and 17 to one. But you might be surprised to know that idle mixture for these new engines can be as lean as 14 to one. Well, thank you, Tech. We'll talk more about air fuel mixture further on. Now, on the intake stroke, the intake valve opens and the exhaust closes as the piston moves downward. This allows mixture to pass from the carburetor into the combustion chamber. When the piston moves down, it produces low pressure or suction in the cylinder. Because of this, atmospheric pressure on the incoming air forces the mixture through the intake manifold and past the intake valve. The manifold passage is made large and direct so there'll be low restriction to flow. This serves to pass in as much mixture as possible in the short time the intake valve is open on the intake stroke. And if you're wondering why the intake valve is larger than the exhaust, it's because the intake mixture is under relatively low atmospheric pressure coming in. Exhaust gas is forced out by the upcoming piston and high gas pressure, so it doesn't need as big a hole to escape. Good point, Stick. Now, on the compression stroke, the intake and exhaust valves are closed as the piston moves upward. This traps the mixture charge so it can be compressed by the piston. And the more you compress the mixture, the more push you get in return when the power is released. Next, ignition occurs as the piston nears the top of the stroke. The spark plug fires and the charge starts burning, beginning at the spark plug electrodes. Normally, the flame spreads out evenly from the spark plug electrodes to all parts of the chamber. The charge burns quickly but does not explode. You see, if there's an explosion, instead of even burning when the spark plug fires, it produces full pressure instantly near the top of the stroke. This fast pressure buildup wastes power and can cause serious damage to engine parts. On the power stroke, we want the mixture to burn gradually so the expansion of the combustion gases will force the piston down with steady pressure the full length of the stroke. In other words, we want progressive burning rather than instant combustion. 
Now, why don't you cover combustion in more detail for the newer fellas? Okay, Tech. The main things to keep in mind are the facts that high temperature ignites the mixture. And this ignition can happen in several ways. We normally get this high temperature ignition from the spark because we want the mixture to start burning at a specific degree of crankshaft rotation. This properly timed ignition will produce the most effective combustion forces during the right part of the power stroke. As the burning progresses, the expanding gases raise the pressure and temperature of the remaining unburned mixture at the far sides of the combustion chamber. However, under some conditions, combustion chamber pressure and temperature can get high enough to explode the unburned mixture. This is the cause of what we call detonation knock, as well as the power loss and parts damage I mentioned earlier. Now, in normal combustion, if the fuel octane is correct for the engine compression ratio and all other conditions are normal, the anti-knock compounds in the fuel reduce the tendency of high pressure and temperature to explode the mixture. However, even with the correct octane fuel, detonation knock can result from advancing the ignition timing setting too far, from engine overheating, from high intake air temperature, or from a mixture too lean for heavy loads. And that covers intake, compression, and power strokes. So the exhaust stroke is next. Here the intake valve remains closed and the exhaust valve opens. So the upcoming piston can force the burned gases out past the exhaust valve into the exhaust outlet system. Before you go any farther, Joe, what's the story on valve overlap? I simplified valve operation for the four-stroke cycle explanation. Actually, the valves stay open a lot longer to allow more time for the mixture and gases to get in and out of the combustion chamber. You see, the valve passages and the combustion chamber are shaped to control the direction of intake and exhaust flow. This permits both valves to be opened longer without seriously contaminating incoming mixture with outgoing exhaust gas. So much for basic principles. Now, why don't you tell us how mixture and timing are affected by different engine operating conditions? All right, Tech. We'll keep it simple by first talking about mixture and timing changes separately, and then we'll cover their combined effects. Reduced to the simplest terms, too rich a mixture wastes fuel. At the other extreme, too lean a mixture cuts down engine power. For example, here's what happens in the combustion chamber. When we have too rich a mixture, it doesn't have enough oxygen to burn completely. This means that part of each mixture charge does not produce power and is blown out unburned through the exhaust system. In a typical combustion chamber, a mixture that is too rich can also make combustion deposits build up faster. If deposits build up too much in the combustion chamber, they can raise pressure high enough to cause detonation knock. Along with this, combustion chamber deposits act like insulation which reduces heat transfer to the coolant in the jacket around the chamber. This trapped heat raises the temperature of the unburnt mixture and can also cause detonation. And one more thing. Heavy chamber deposits flake off and leave rough edges. The edges get red hot during combustion and can stay hot long enough to ignite the incoming mixture. This uncontrolled ignition is the cause of what we call pre-ignition knock. In the opposite direction, when we have a lean mixture, as we do with light engine loads, there's less gasoline to burn and produce expanding combustion gases, so it develops less power. Well, that takes care of the basic effects of mixture changes. Now, as you might expect, ignition timing variation also changes things. For example, when the spark plug fires before the piston reaches the top of the compression stroke, we say the timing is early or advanced. In other words, combustion starts to produce gas pressure while the piston is still moving up on the compression stroke. But since the mixture takes some time to burn, we ignite it early to get more complete combustion. Uh, hold the ignition, Joe. We won't be able to keep this session's combustion going if someone doesn't turn the record over to the other side. In actual operation, the amount of timing advance needed is affected by mixture, 
engine temperature, engine speed, and engine load. But in general, if the timings advance too far, we'll have hard starting and detonation problems. When we have over-advanced timing, the spark plugs run hotter than normal. This causes fast electrode wear, and there'll probably be trouble with porcelains cracking or chipping at the firing tip. Thanks, Dick. Now, with most of today's engines, the timing for different loads and speeds is in varying degrees of advance before the piston reaches top dead center. However, if the initial timing is incorrectly set in retard position, ignition occurs after the piston passes top center. Here, the ignition spark is late for all engine speeds and loads. If the timing is retarded too far, the mixture burning continues as the piston moves downward. And even though the mixture charge burns completely, the combustion gases cannot expand fully by the end of the power stroke, so power is lost. In addition to this, retarded timing also causes the engine to run hotter because more of the cylinder wall, as well as the combustion chamber, is exposed to the burning mixture. Retarded combustion also raises exhaust temperatures. I'm with you on the general idea of mixture and timing changes, but I'm a bit hazy on the reasons why they change for different engine operating conditions. Okay, Frank. Let's begin with starting a cold engine. First of all, cold gasoline doesn't vaporize easily or mix evenly. This tends to make the mixture spotty, so parts of the combustion charge do not have enough fuel to ignite. And to complicate things, Fuel vaporizing and mixing is further retarded because the carburetor, intake manifold, combustion chambers, and incoming air are also cold. So, to make cold starting easier, we use the carburetor choke valve to enrich the mixture. In effect, we temporarily add extra gasoline to compensate for reduced vaporization and poor distribution of the fuel. Of course, the choke valve gradually opens to restore the correct mixture as the engine warms up, and fuel in the mixture vaporizes more completely and evenly. Now returning to the cold starting condition. The engine turns over at relatively low speed when it's cranking, so there's not much inertia or flywheel action to keep the engine turning before it starts. For this reason, we begin with a minimum amount of timing advance so the early combustion pressure will not oppose the upcoming piston. This reduces engine cranking resistance and makes starting easier. I know the distributor has vacuum and centrifugal advance controls. What's the reason for two of them? Basically, the vacuum unit's controlled by carburetor throttle opening, so it affects fuel economy. The centrifugal unit follows engine speed and affects power output. The two timing controls work separately. At cranking speed, there's not enough carburetor vacuum to cause vacuum unit movement, and there's no centrifugal advance. So the startup timing stays at the minimum advance position. But at curb idle, with the engine warmed up, the compression pressure is low, but the choke is now open, so we have a relatively lean mixture. This and slight dilution of the mixture by any exhaust gas left in the chamber slows down combustion. In this case, the throttle is at idle position, and carburetor vacuum is relatively weak, so the vacuum unit does not advance. And because the engine is running at idle, the centrifugal unit has no effect, so the ignition timing remains at the basic initial setting. Now, at low engine speed with light or road load, we also have relatively low compression pressure and a lean mixture. This combination slows down combustion, so both vacuum and centrifugal timing advance are needed to produce smooth power. On the other hand, where we have low engine speed but full load, the mixture is relatively rich. The combustion is faster and less timing advance is needed. Here the throttle is open, so there's no vacuum advance, but the centrifugal unit follows engine speed. At the other end of the range, where we have high engine speed at road load, the mixture leans out. The throttle is open part way, so there's some vacuum advance. And because the centrifugal unit follows engine speed, there's a proportional amount of centrifugal advance. However, at high engine speed with full load, the mixture becomes rich, so combustion is faster. 
Here, the open throttle keeps the vacuum advance at zero, and the centrifugal unit produces the proper advance for the speeded up combustion. How about acceleration? What happens there? If you floorboard the pedal, the throttle opens wide and lets in a lot of air. The main jets in the carburetor can't keep up with all the changes that take place, so the mixture tends to go lean. But before the engine stumbles, you get help from the carburetor acceleration and power systems to compensate for the temporary lean condition, and the engine speeds up smoothly. When you load the engine like this, the acceleration speed increase raises compression pressure, which makes the mixture charge burn faster. Now this calls for less timing advance. The open throttle lowers manifold vacuum, and the vacuum advance is reduced, but the centrifugal unit advances. Another thing to remember is that full throttle acceleration raises compression to its highest pressure. This concentrates the mixture density, so the charge is harder to ignite. This means the ignition system must be in top-notch condition to prevent power loss through misfiring. Does anything special happen when you decelerate? Well, the power situation reverses, because in deceleration, the drive line turns the engine instead of the other way around. This motoring effect is not as great in cars with automatic transmissions when they are in drive range. Now, when you let up on the pedal, the throttle valve closes and the carburetor delivers only what the idle system can supply. However, since the engine is turning faster than idle speed, there's not enough mixture drawn in to ignite easily. While this is going on, there's no vacuum advance but the centrifugal unit still follows engine speed. This does not keep the timing on deceleration advanced enough for complete combustion, so part of the mixture passes out of the exhaust unburned. Incomplete combustion on deceleration doesn't affect fuel economy too seriously, but all master technicians will soon be servicing cars designed to reduce the emission of unburnt mixture. Right. All of our 68 U.S. models and some Canadian models will have the CAP system, which will improve deceleration combustion with a leaner mixture and additional timing advance. And curb idle combustion will be better also because we'll have leaner idling mixtures and idle timing will be in retired position to get more complete burning. Now, why don't you give us a fast review on the mixture and timing at different load and speed conditions, Joe? Okay, I'll take them off for you in short form. First, with low engine speed and road load, the mixture is lean, so the combustion is slower. Vacuum advance is at or near maximum, and the centrifugal unit is at about one-half full advance. Next, with low speed and full load, the mixture is rich, and combustion is faster than at idle. There's no vacuum advance, and here again, the centrifugal unit is at about one-half full advance. Now, moving up to high speed at road load, the mixture is lean and combustion is faster as a result of high engine speed. In this case, there's some vacuum advance and the centrifugal unit is near the full advance point. Finally, still at high speed, but with full load, the mixture is rich and combustion is faster than at low speeds. Here we have no vacuum advance, and the centrifugal unit is near the full advance position. Now as a final point, we should all recognize the fact that our older engines were not as sensitive to variations in fuel mixture and ignition timing. You could be off a little on your adjustments without causing serious trouble. But that's all in the past. In other words, we really have to toe the line on settings and adjustments with these newer engines. Right. Precision adjustment is the only way to go when you service today's engines, especially those with a cap system. You'll have to stick to the specs all the way. And that brings us to the end of this story on today's engines. As usual, you'll find additional information on the subject in your reference books. And now, more than ever, pay close attention to the specs and instructions in your service manuals. The next session will pick up where this one ends to give you the inside story on exhaust emission control. You'll be servicing these systems all over the country, so be sure to attend the meeting to find out what it's all about. 
See you all next month.